Thank you, Dr. Dubé. Uh, we're now going to open this uh, session up to questions, and I ask people to come to the microphone and please identify yourselves. And while that's happening, I will take my prerogative as moderator and ask a couple of questions. And I address this to both Dr. Moran and Dr. Margolsky, uh, which is, Tim, you talked about um, responses in the stomach uh, being vagal afferents being stimulated by load and not specific macro, macronutrients. But what you showed was saline and glucose, and I'm hoping that you would discuss a little bit about other macronutrients, namely fat or protein. Do you find the same thing? And Dr. Margoski, on a similar vein, you discussed responses of taste receptors in the gut to sweet taste. But what about to other macronutrients, protein um, and or fats, as well as other tastes, such as sodium. So um, from an electrophysiology standpoint, we have done a comparison between glucose and casein, and we don't see a difference from an intragastric content standpoint. Um, we've done experiments with using a pyloric cuff and looking at how gastric loads of various nutrient character affect subsequent food intake. And in that situation, the, um, the nutrient content of the gastric load across carbohydrate, fats, and proteins doesn't differentiate what the response is. The response in terms of reducing food intake is to what the intragastric volume is. Um, as far as uh, what we've done uh, is to look at um, uh, enteroendocrine cells in different parts of, of the gut, and in the proximal gut, uh, we see much more uh, of an effect of um, sugars and sweeteners for release of GLP-1 uh, and uh, GIP, and then in the distal gut, where you wouldn't expect uh, sugars to be uh, reaching. Um, there we've seen uh, at least some association with short-chain fatty acid responses uh, leading to release of GLP-1. So I think you have uh, specialization depending upon where uh, in the gut uh, your uh, L or K cells are uh, as to uh, what macronutrient uh, they're going to be um, um, uh, experiencing, uh, but depending upon where in the gut in, in this could extend and include uh, the taste cells, um, there is involvement of the taste G protein, Gus Dusen, and um, in some cases, the sweet taste receptor in the response. What, what has been um, less um, worked out is uh, any particular involvement for the T2 or bitter receptors uh, in the gut. Um, and in fact, the evidence for their expression is weaker uh, and certainly evidence for a physiologic role for them uh, in the gut is, is weaker. And salt? Uh, salt, um, we don't know so much. Uh, uh, you know, in taste, there's good evidence for ENAC being involved in a um, low um, sodium concentration salt response, but there's also a, a suggestion that there's a different salt receptor out there uh, that could respond to high uh, salt concentrations and uh, in some cases be uh, aversive. How that would uh, equate to um, uh, salt responding cells uh, in, in the gut, I, I just couldn't say. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rick Mattis, Purdue University. So my question, I guess, is directed to Bob. Um, Tim made a very good point in his presentation about uh, how studying a particular receptor or tissue in isolation may give a different impression than if it's studied in the context of whole body or, or whatever. And, and, and Bob made the point of how stimulation of one type of cell may influence responsivity of, of another through various mechanisms. Can you talk about um, this continuum that you described about sensory signaling throughout the GI tract? How important um, is taste in modulating the response of the, say, the expression of SGLT1 and glucose absorption. Uh, the studies where you just infuse sweeteners, for example, I think don't give the same response as when it's presented orally. Can, can you kind of expand on that? And then, if I could double on to this, uh, Dr. Dubay's interesting 
uh, literature about cognitive influences on, on physiology. How good is a rat model for studying these phenomena? Um, so uh, certainly, uh, ideally, one would be looking at the whole organism and in, uh, integrative uh, systemic uh, responses. Uh, from a, a practical point of view, we do many reductionist uh, reduced preparations where we drive the system to be able to see a response, uh, for example, with isolated pancreatic islets. We can do things to the islets that would be much harder to do uh, to uh, uh, an intact uh, animal model, rat uh, or a, a mouse. And so uh, it is incumbent on us, if we can see a response in an artificial reduced uh, system, be it uh, isolated tissues or cell lines, to then go back in the whole animal and say, well, does it matter? How important is it? Uh, and um, uh, we're struggling a little bit with knowing how important the effect of uh, high potency non caloric sweeteners is on uh, insulin and GLP 1 responses. I didn't have time to show uh, some uh, very interesting. Uh, um, published information from a, a couple of groups on effects in human subjects. Rebecca Brown's work on uh, mixing uh, non-caloric uh, uh, sweeteners with a uh, sugar uh, load in a kind of a, um, uh, oral glucose tolerance uh, type setting where you could see in human subjects uh, an increase uh, in GLP-1 levels uh, these are, you know, in, in intact uh, human subjects circulating GLP-1 levels, but there was not a change in their insulin levels. So, you know, there uh, is something where we could drive uh, changes in insulin with isolated uh, islets, and um, in some cases we can, cha we can drive changes in insulin in an animal model with uh, injection uh, uh, of uh, high uh, levels of sweetener, and the physiologic relevance of that uh, would be uh, questionable. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, it may be worth considering and uh, worth uh, taking with a note of caution that this might point out that under um, uh, many years and with high ingestion of uh, high potency uh, non-calorics, there, there could be effects that um, we should just be uh, aware of. So I tried to be fairly cautious in not uh, uh, over-interpreting and over-extending uh, from uh, the data, but I think there is something uh, there uh, worth noting and worth considering it if, if it does have uh, effects. Now, there, there are some uh, clear physiologic uh, effects of the taste cells systemically um, that um, uh, we, we've uh, detected, and uh, Karen Teff was uh, looking at things like this, which would be cephalic phase uh, responses. And uh, uh, of course, you know that um, the uh, thought about the cephalic phase response, Pavlovian type response, would uh, involve uh, ideation and the vagal nerve and feedback uh, mechanisms, and that is all quite uh, true and, and certainly the case, but some of the cephalic phase response seems to be uh, um, kind of hardwired uh, into the uh, endocrine cells of the taste organ. So just as um, uh, intraendocrine cells in the gut have taste uh, receptors uh, and that gives some of their chemosensory response, the taste cells have uh, GLP-1 and GIP and some uh, other hormones, and we can drive their uh, response uh, in isolation with uh, extracted uh, tissues, and Steve Munger has done this kind of thing uh, with uh, very nice uh, preparation uh, in vitro to look uh, at hormone response from these cells. So some of this uh, response is actually hardwired into the cells, and we can see that uh, when the uh, uh, animals um, have uh, the nerve uh, input uh, removed. So the vagus is cut or the uh, gustatory nerves uh, are cut. So I, I think it's a very complex system where we need to understand each of the parts and understand how it, it, it functions in totality. 
And Dr. Dubé, maybe you can comment on uh, yeah, the I, I will address the, the rat models. part of the question <laughs> in the sense that it, it is the case that rats are not, don't have the key feature that makes us human, which is all the symbolism, all the ability of shifting the course uh, if, uh, if it's not appropriate. Uh, so, so there is, uh, that was for long, I think, a very important limitation of food, uh, of having uh, been studied, food motivation have been studied just in rat, basically. Uh, so that being said, uh, though, uh, very much along the line of what uh, my colleague here was just saying, is that there is a lot of, the p of processes that could be studied with rat, and even at the level of decision making, uh, colleague Peter Shisgal, uh, Shisgal at Concordia is looking at how does the rat at some point make the decision of choosing among a given pattern and so on? So there's, there's more uh, in, in terms of decision making that we can get that we could take at first. And my last point would be, um, it is uh, the limitation that the, we have with the rats not being pre-symbolic uh, pre symbolic and not free will and so on. Uh, I would put them at the limitation of classical economics and, uh, and, and many of, of approach that see human being as being this completely uh, optimizer uh, and utility maximizer. And what this whole work is saying is that if you want to study human behavior, you need to have all pieces, but you also need to get the real world context, which is where it's happening. But it, it's not an either or, it's a portfolio, I think, that has to be enriched. Uh, and Dr. Moran, I think you wanted uh, to comment. On, just on to this comment, uh, on the data that Dr. Dubé was, uh, on, was demonstrating on what the fetal outcomes are, you can certainly show exactly the same kinds of phenomena using using rodents and uh, it gets down to not just from a physiological outcome standpoint but you can show differences from a diet preference and so um, the role of the animal model for those studies lets you ask questions that you can't get to in the human condition uh, it's likely that a number of these long-term effects are mediated through epigenetic changes and rodent uh, models really provide a very good vehicle for getting at just what those kinds of specifics are. Well, let me ask all of you another question to kind of bridge this session with the rest of the conference, which is we've been talking a great deal about uh, response mechanisms that are largely mediated through the vagal nerve and mostly into the hindbrain, although Dr. Ritter, you talked some about um, integrating higher up. And I think a lot of this conference is going to focus on reward values, primarily in the dopamine system, and how that part of reward, which also gets to um, individual responses to food stimuli. So my question is, how do we look at control of meal size, individual peptide components as affecting that, uh, individual receptors responding to that and get to the overall control of um, essentially body weight management, reward systems that are all to do with the uh, higher functionings of the brain. And I'd like all of you to respond. I may, I may start. I think that uh, one of the things that is important is that it's all of the above that contribute information. And there are, uh, there are, I think, methodological interfaces that can be developed. When we hosted the first think tank in 2005, I laugh when I see that I invited all the, the part of the brains uh, that could be potentially involved in eating and obesity. And what was striking to me was to see the appetitive and hypothalamus uh, was completely disconnected with the reward learning, the executive control, the memory, and so on. It has changed now. We were talking about ghrelin, for instance. My colleague Daguerre does study those processes within. So there is, uh, I would say two things. There is a, a meta, um, interface protocol that has to be developed. That's one. But the second part is that, and that's why this kind of having a sense of the system 
at the same time that you delve into the piece that you study, because the, the core uh, cutting edge knowledge in each of the, each of the piece is absolutely necessary, I think what is needed is to understand the piece within the bigger context. And that's why us, we move to, we have very, very diversified methodology where you take theory, models, metrics, you combine the empirical basis, you play a bit with the computational. Look at systems biology. It's system biology society that we need to, to move forward. Uh, no, you have yours. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> I think, I, I personally think of this in the terms of, of our, that food intake is controlled by our sensory experiences. And, uh, and those experiences affect the reward value and things. And so when we examine things at the cellular level and at the hindbrain level, we tend to think of them as being, as ascending into uh, the reward areas and the and, and, uh, uh, primary sensory areas and association areas and the like. Um, I guess I would point out that, that I think that, uh, that there's a good deal of evidence that there is a there's sort of a local sign for these experiences too, in the in this in our case in the gastrointestinal uh, tract, and that um, experiences such as we're talking about with taste and context and that are likely to influence those experiences experiences by descending effects, and so um, so I think that what we're talking about is all of a piece, uh, and if we understand those pieces. Uh, better, then we can um, then we can begin to study them in the context that 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 you that you're asking for. One of the other aspects here is we've really been concentrating on what the peripheral mediation is here, but a number of the uh, the hormones or the circulating factors that we're talking about do have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's been extensively demonstrated that just as they are affecting these peripheral pathways, they can be having direct effects on the brain reward pathways. Okay, uh, we have, uh, um, please Hi. identify yourself. Uh, my name is Jesse Carlin. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the NIDDK. And I had a question in regards to the vagal affer aff um, afferents and nutrient sensing. And if I'm understanding it correctly, it's a feedback loop to maybe decrease meal size. Um, but obesity could be considered a state of overconsumption. Is there evidence of um, loss of this feedback loop or downregulation of receptors of this um, in the state of obesity? Yes. Um, the, the shorter answer is, is, is yes. Um, um, there is um, there's studies in both the animal and human literature indicating that meal size is increased um, and that if, if, if humans are allowed to select uh, uh, from a cafeteria that they that there's a correlation of increase increased meal size in in animals and humans um, uh, there's there's evidence that Downregulation of leptin sensitivity leads to uh, an, an increase in, in in meal size, and that the types of diets that animals are on tend to induce changes in vagal afferent signaling that that would favor decreased uh, nutrient sensing and hence decreased caloric caloric feedback of the kind that you ask about. Um, and just a quick second part: Do you think it's because of overstimulation leading to decreased sensitivity or maybe the macronutrients of the diet itself? I think, I think there's evidence for both of those things. Um, there's evidence for uh, the development of, of leptin resistance, which we don't entirely understand. And there's evidence that, for example, uh, feed, con consuming high-fat diets leads to uh, down-regulation, for example, of CCK signaling and visceral afferent signaling from from nutrients in the gut via, via CCK and, um, and, and other gastrointestinal peptides. So there's acute effects like that, or um, dietary effects, and then there's certainly metabolic effects uh, that, that, that also play in there. Thank you. 
Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike Kelly from Wrigley, um, and I, it's fascinating to me to, to talk about that interplay of, of um, behavior versus the signals. I think we have the perfect lab because in about 25 minutes we're going to walk out for lunch on your own, and we're going to make a lot of decisions very quickly um, and what drives those decisions. So with that as my premise, um, I think my questions are for Dr. Dubay, but I'd like to hear any thoughts. There are a couple of pieces of data um, jumped out at me from the slides. One was on the soft drink consumption that um, it was predicted soft drink consumption from, from data that existed. And then the other one was the odds of a fast food, a visit to a fast food restaurant. And so I, I wondered about your thoughts on that type of data as a way to generate a hypothesis, but maybe looking for more direct and, and better quality data and, and maybe the methods. And um, the, the second point, I've just forgotten, so um, <laughs> I'll listen to your answer and, and uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Yeah, um, um, the, the predicted model uh, that I was talking about uh, within the context of the soft drink is that when you, uh, when you want to be able, because the, the, the standard in uh, clinical epidemiology or when you want to make inference at the population, uh, there is very rigorous standard that have to be maintained. And uh, the, the, the modeling uh, model that you get there was to move from uh, the actual uh, sampling of stores uh, the, uh, the, in, the, in the private data we were using in order to really using uh, Bayesian uh, statistics, really being able to have uh, a more population level uh, estimate that is independent of the fact that the sample of store in one region is within uh, is uh, done in some way. So that is that was really uh, the the predicted model was to be able to infer from uh, the commercial data we have something at the population level. Uh, that being said, uh, and uh, the one for the fast food, uh, this one uh, was actually uh, looking at the, the, the number of outlets in a given neighborhood um, and uh, that define in some geographical area around where a person lives. Um, so that, so I'm not presenting thing as a, as a substitute or any experimental research or anyone. It's really exactly as you said, uh, society, uh, uh, we kind of uh, let it to the political science without necessarily empirically and theoretically studying it. And that's very much this idea of trying to enrich the method, the data, the theory and the models of biology behavior within a given context. So and the, other, the other thing that it did come back to me was, um, I wonder if you'd comment, it, from the clinical area, there are indications, if you, if you listen to people that work on emotional eating, that certain cognitive behavioral therapies can be very effective for some people, not for everybody. And I wondered if, if that kind of stream came into your work. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I think I need to give a bit more information of this emotional um, schema, which is essentially uh, indicating that uh, you are likely to, he to eat to manage your negative emotion, whether it's sadness, depression, anxiety, and so on. So that is the schema in the Dutch. Uh, now, that being said, if you have uh, uh, individuals, obese or, or, or not obese, that have this predisposition, very likely uh, the solution will also be the type of emotional reinforcement, behavioral therapy, and so on. So one was more, uh, the, the Dutch is more about uh, identifying those individuals that more likely will need the type of uh, intervention you are talking about. Kathy Greaves, uh, principal scientist at the Kellogg Company. Uh, my, my first question is for the first three speakers, I think, and it's more of a practical um, question from a research perspective. We have uh, many studies today that look at gut hormones, circulating gut hormones, and aren't finding any relationship between those levels at one, two, three hours 
and um, changes in subjective measures of appetite or food intake at a later time. Are we, um, are we going down the wrong path looking at those gut hormone levels in the plasma as opposed to um, knowing that there's that direct uh, effect that's happening between the gut and the brain? What should we be getting out of the research that's, that's being done looking at the hormones in the blood today? And then my second question is for Dr. Dubé, and that is in regard to your, um, in, uh, to your body weight or, or birth weight data. Mm -hmm. As we go into this afternoon's session and, and tomorrow's sessions as well, as we present this data looking at um, obesity and um, addiction, quote unquote, um, or obesity and food intake, should we also be considering for all of these studies, for all of this research, making sure that we look into the, the, the upbringing or the, the, the um, inner utero um, aspects of, of, the, of the people that we're looking at as opposed to looking at these cross-sectional mm -hmm. sort of studies, lean versus obese, without really digging into you know, what happened as they came up into the B city or as they stayed in the lean track. Uh, from a gut uh, hormone measurement standpoint in the plaza, in the plasma, um, if you look back about 20 years ago, one of the arguments against a physiological role for some of these gut hormones in uh, contributing to satiety was just the lack of correlation data that you're talking about. Um, antagonist experiments, though, um, made it clear that a hormonal action for many of these in producing satiety was probably not what was going on, and it was more of a paracrine kind of a phenomena. Um, on the other hand, uh, a number of the hormone studies that have been done have been looking at hormones released in one meal and then looking at what the effect is on the second meal. and. Many of these, as was pointed out by Bob Ritter, are involved in meal termination rather than in extending what the intermeal interval is and affecting hunger going into the subsequent uh, meal. And so uh, where some of the correlations are now getting positive is in the bariatric surgery kind of condition where the hormone release is greatly exaggerated because of the changes in what the plumbing is basically and getting nutrients in high concentrations to sites where they normally would not be occurring. And in those situations, the correlations do turn out to be positive. If I could, if I could just add a little bit to that, I think that, um, that that one of the things that we haven't paid too much attention to with regard to the signaling of gut peptides on vagal afferents and other places where they act is the fact that these G protein coupled receptors often uh, display constitutive activity or activity with very little agonist around or with low levels of agonist around. And, um, and so, so that's one issue I think that needs investigation, in other words, what, to what extent do the, does the very existence of these, of these a coupled receptors uh, facilitate or, it, or is, it, is necessary for the effective signaling of, of, of the nerve? And then, then secondly, um, the, the fact that there are um, convergent inputs to these systems and that the metabolic state of the animal uh, is going to, or the person is going to affect uh, positively or negatively, the correlation between the, the, the peptide level and the behavioral response uh, is also something that, that often isn't controlled as well as, you know, it's controlled as well as we can in human studies, but, but maybe not adequately to, to pull out what's actually going on with the hormones. And I think those are two directions that we need to consider uh, studying. I will address your, 
your question in three points. Uh, one, about the importance of looking at kids and the way they build their whole relation to food, relation to reward, relation to, to, to life. Uh, it's, it is uh, very key and the shift that the obesity work has taken, and I'll talk more tomorrow, on addiction has been uh, narrowly focusing on reinforcement learning and addiction process and so on. And there's so many other uh, process involved in food. Uh, the process that were presented this morning are key to food. They are not there when you talk about cocaine. Uh, so this notion of reductionistic effects, uh, effect of looking at obesity strictly at addiction, that's one point. Uh, but two points that I would like to make back to the children. Um, there was, I don't know if uh, it's an um, uh, American Journal of, Medi of um, Medical Association or New England Journal of Medicine, but there was a recent paper uh, about uh, childhood obesity, how if you try to predict later how the first five years are very key in, in building this, and that was empirically uh, based on large uh, population. Um, and the last point, uh, the model that I did not uh, have time to, uh, to present, but that is published if you want to have, where we started uh, from the basic temporal differential learning uh, of, of dopamine learning, uh, and we progressively add individual differences in your rate of learning and your sensi sensitivity to reward. But the part that is relevant to what you say is that we then ask more, add more complexity in terms of the type of food environment that, you, that our regions were exposed to and at what, what time uh, uh, over, over time. Um, and uh, we talk about this lock-in effects in this paper is that if, and, and here it was strictly computational for now, we are working uh, on, the, uh, on empirical uh, validation with real, real uh, subjects, uh, but uh, the agents that were exposed early to um, an environment with a low density of high caloric fat and sugar food, they were learning, because the environment changed, they were learning at a much lower pace to like the, the high fat and sugar. So the notion of your first exposure in your pattern of learning in this model goes also in the direction of saying pay attention <laughs> to fetal and young environment much more than is currently done. <laughs> Dr. Margolis, did you want to comment? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Chandler Weiland, if this were a kitchen drawer, I am not the sharpest tool. Um, so I don't know if my question is better addressed by Dr. Margolsky or Dr. Moran. Um, so anyway, um, my dad injured his brain. And so, as a result, he gained about 100 pounds in about 100 days. So I can totally buy into Dr. Margolsky's satiety and um, sensors in, in the gut. Somewhere there was a, a feedback loop that just wasn't working. So, but my question is fascinating. All of you guys were very fascinating, and young lady. So my question is, Alzheimer's is being a type 3 diabetes and with these sensors, these taste sensors in the pancreas, is there a relationship there? Or? I think I'll go <laughs> <laughs> It's a deep question. <laughs> on, we've known. On, we've known for a long, long time that on that various kinds of. Uh, brain injuries can produce excessive uh, weight loss and it's generally in response to excessive uh, food intake. He, he, he said he had absolutely no satiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him about the sensors in the pancreas, he said, well, they're not satiety. Sure, sure. Now, and then um, on the relationship between a drop in insulin sensitivity and Alzheimer's and various other kinds of dementias is now 
well documented. So uh, um, insulin does play a feedback role on food intake when it gets into the brain. And so if you've got a drop in insulin sensitivity like occurs in type 2 diabetes, for example, uh, the metabolic break on food intake is going to be diminished. Also, if you've got a lack in insulin sensitivity, your glucose transport is going to be affected. And so in Alzheimer's and some other dementias, there's a deficit in the brain's ability to get the kind of glucose that it needs for the normal, normal functioning. Dr. Rolls. Um, Edmund Rolls, Oxford. Um, I work on brain systems involved in reward, which are exquisitely beautifully tuned to different food properties, taste, smell, texture, and so on. <clears throat> so I want to ask a little bit more about the feedback signals we're getting from the gut. Are they really not doing any nutrient-specific control, which I think is the sort of answer that's been given, but I'd like to sort of probe a little bit more than that. So if one puts umami into the gut versus, say, glucose into the gut, does that have any differential effects on taste reward for umami versus glucose or on subsequent eating behavior within about half an hour or so of umami versus glucose? And as a follow-up question to that, I'd like to ask um, <clears throat> whether there's whether any interesting thoughts on the fact that different amino acids in the gut might have different satiating potency. There has been a claim from Kunio Torii in Japan that uh, MSG is particularly effective in the gut in producing satiety and in c controlling dietary-induced obesity. And then just one last follow-up question. <laughs> it looks as if the umami <laughs> system is a bit different in humans to rodents seems to be more specifically sensitive to MSG relative to other amino acids in humans than it is in rodents. Um, that's true for the taste system. Uh, what about the gut system? Do we know? So uh, let, let me start, and let me start with the um, taste system before getting to the gut. Uh, and, and certainly there are significant differences um, in um, umami receptors between humans and, and rodents. And here I'm talking about uh, T1R1 and T1R3. Uh, and these receptors can be expressed heterologously and examined for their sensitivity to particular amino acids. And there are uh, significant differences between how the human versus the rodent T1R1 and T1R3 uh, pairs would work, and that may explain some sensory differences between uh, rodent preference and human preference for particular amino acids and distinguishing uh, particular amino acids uh, by taste. Now, when you take that down to the gut, um, uh, and even before you take it to the gut, it gets a little more complicated because um, we can talk about umami receptors, um, uh, amino acid detectors, or in human, maybe more specific monosodium glutamate detectors. But there's quite good evidence that even in the taste cells, um, it's not just T1R1 and T1R3, uh, but you have other family C, G protein coupled receptors, uh, metabotropic uh, glutamate receptor 1, metabotropic glutamate receptor 4. There may be uh, taste isoforms of these uh, receptors that are uh, missing part of the extracellular domain and change uh, their response properties. There probably also are um, uh, inotropic. Uh, glutamate receptors expressed uh, in taste cells. So it's rather a, a complicated stimulus to tease out and say, what is the relevant receptor even just in a taste cell responding to a particular uh, amino acid? And then uh, as you would uh, then go uh, into the gut and look for that, um, I think it's probably just about as complicated to know uh, if there is a single receptor or multiple receptors in which types of cells it's in. So from um, Tori's group, uh, Anna San Gabriel, 
uh, had some very nice work uh, showing expression of particular types of metabotropic uh, glutamates uh, in uh, uh, entero uh, endocrine cells, and I, I think that uh, is properly there uh, in in the rodent system. Um, but exactly what's the relevant uh, receptor uh, is a bit of a challenge to, to tease out. Can someone pick up on the, <clears throat> the nutrient-specific feedback? If, if I put... Well, uh, Tim, we're, you were really talking about not nutrient-specific only for the stomach. That definitely right, right. In that's the correct. Duodenum, that's correct. So when, um, when the nutrients are confined to the stomach, you don't really have nutrient-specific feedback. Uh, from an intestinal standpoint, you certainly do. So um, on, you're stimulating different kinds of receptors on, depending upon what the nutrient is, and um, the absorptive processes across the nutrients are very, very different, and their ability to release various of the peptides that we were talking about, again, is quite variable. Um, Tony Scalfani has demonstrated that uh, we can learn about uh, nutrients in the gastrointestinal tract and learn to differentiate. So clearly, um, there, are s there are systems that uh, respond to the kinds of different effects that different nutrients have within the intestine. And I think an important point there to emphasize that is that those effects may be conditioned. Yes. Effectively. Yeah. Yes. So one, I one, okay. yeah, just one other um, uh, point to, to add to this, which is the, the taste system uh, is, uh, is pretty good at uh, distinguishing uh, one nutrient from another, sweet from salty, from bitter, from uh, umami, uh, and so on. And there's a uh, pretty good segregation uh, at the taste cell level of you have uh, sweet receptors in these cells that respond to sweet and you have T1R1 and 3 umami receptors along with some of the other glutamate receptors in other subsets of cells and the T2R bitter receptors are in yet different cells. So that's very segregated and, and pretty good uh, at distinguishing things. Um, the evidence is not fully in yet uh, about what's going on in these gut taste cells, but at least some of the preliminary evidence would argue that the segregation is, is not there, or at least not there as rigidly as you find uh, in the oral taste system. So you could have these um, uh, taste-like cells that have both sweet and umami receptors or sweet and bitter receptors. So they may be, at least some of them, more generalist chemosensory cells rather than segregationist, what is the particular macronutrient uh, involved. But that, that's kind of work in progress. I think we uh, have a question from the web, and we'd like to give our web people an opportunity. Yes, thank you. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Jennifer Nasser from Drexel University, and she asked specifically, um, for um, directed toward Dr. Mogulski, um, you mentioned that sucralose promoted insulin release in wild-type mice. Uh, would you expect the same response in mice or rats that are pre-diabetic or have type 2 diabetes? Um, so uh, I, I think we would uh, probably at first principles expect the same kind uh, of response, um, but uh, the evidence is, is not uh, in yet. So we actually haven't done the studies to look uh, at what kind of effects there are on uh, obese or uh, diabetic or pre-diabetic um, mice uh, or rats. So we can't know exactly what that would be doing to the um, T1R2, T1R3 uh, receptors uh, in the pancreas and whether uh, those are going to be uh, altered uh, along the same lines that um, would be happening to um, other uh, targets of, of glucose detection in the pancreas. So jury's out on that. Hello, I'm Patricia Williamson from Tate and Lyle. Kind of in a follow-up with Kathy's earlier question about are we maybe following some of the wrong things. The panel went through very elegantly some of the more established uh, satiety hormones, PYY, CCK, 
uh, GLP-1 and ghrelin and, and leptin, but I'm kind of wondering about a little bit more of some of the things that have been emerging a little bit, like adiponectin, FG, uh, F21, insulin and glucagon, new kind of roles for them uh, in signaling FGF15 through 19, and then also uh, where the vagal liver connection kind of comes in, the signaling to the liver for metabolic responses and how you might think that is playing into appetite regulation because of the metabolic effects or energy balance that may overall come into signaling to people um, their energy status and how that is also influenced here. And additionally, the periphery outside of the gut, the uh, liver, brown fat, and muscle, and the responsiveness now that we know about postprandial melacortin, for example, in the circulation and where those come into play. And obviously, there's, there's a lot to be done looking at multiple cytokines with regard to control of food intake, both in in health and in, during illness, um, and I think that uh, I think that that's um, that, that that area is ripe for much more investigation, as you as you suggest. Um, you know, I, I I can't say anything about it in terms of what's happening from the gut uh, during uh, during during health, but certainly during during disease states, those things are. Are, are clearly involved in control of control of appetite um, and uh, and involved in satiation, but um, I've forgotten now what your additional <laughs> part of your question. Just how is. much more that that overall Maylu needs to be considered when we go to measuring, for example, visual analog scales of hunger and yeah. fullness in relationship to the hormones, if you're only measuring, maybe the reason that we're not correlating those all the time is we're not measuring the right hormones or we're not taking into account the overall metabolic state of the individual. Do you think that that's possibly to explain right. I think that, the variability? I think that that latter point is really important. You know, not only the metabolic state, but the other, the other contextual uh, aspects and, and, and neural aspects. The young woman who asked the question about her father being sustaining a brain injury and gaining weight. I don't know what the injury is, but it's, it's always remarkable how many different parts of the brain um, lead to overeating um, right. when they're damaged. Uh, I mean, hippocampal damage leads to, uh, if it's in the right place, leads to overeating and development of, o of obesity. And these are, this is an indication of this longitudinal organization and, and, and context that we've all emphasized, I think. Um, sounds like you and I. Um, I think the point that you're uh, making is really a very important, important one. And um, it's been clear that a focus on individual signals has not really taken us anywhere from a therapeutic standpoint. And uh, understanding what the range of signals are, what the interactions are, and how they may change across various kinds of states is likely to be much more informative in terms of where we may be able to intervene. Uh, clearly, um, we have not been winning the war here. Uh, Rick, please yep. restate your name. Uh, so anticipating that this afternoon and tomorrow there'll be a fair amount of talk about fat and its role in, in feeding and possibly addiction and so on. Bob, I'm not picking on you, but I noticed you didn't talk about fat as a taste stimulus. Um, can you talk about uh, oral sensory detection of fats and effects on physiology? So, um I guess it's still a, a little bit controversial about whether uh, fat uh, is a real taste uh, or a, a taste uh, modifier, modulator. There are a few candidate uh, receptors out there for uh, fat taste, and um, uh, I mean, you could speak to this uh, uh, much more eloquently uh, th than I, so I, I want to tread carefully uh, in, in what I uh, say about it. Um, he sat down already. 
so I, I think indeed there are uh, fat taste receptors out there, but are they responding to triglycerides? Are they responding to free fatty acids? Is it uh, a, an appetitive or an aversive uh, stimulus? So um, it's complicated and uh, it's messy and it's not nearly as uh, clean uh, and easy to tease out as uh, sweet and, and bitter uh, uh, and umami. But you know, my personal opinion is there is a fat taste out there and um, uh, there probably is an appetitive uh, fat taste out there. Uh, uh, and I suspect that that's different from the free fatty acid uh, taste responses. Now, um, something that I didn't have a chance to, to talk about and touch on uh, are uh, some of the effects on feeding behavior in certain of our knockout mice. So, uh, and this is work uh, done in collaboration with Tony Sclafani and, and John Glendinning. Uh, and, and some others we've worked with. But um, uh, Gus Dusan knockout mice and TRIP-M5 knockout mice and T103 knockout mice um, all resist, uh, to a certain extent, uh, diet-induced obesity. Uh, and that would include uh, uh, fat uh, in the diet. Um, so there may very well be uh, oral and post-ingestive uh, uh, gut uh, uh, endocrine uh, fat sensors that are tying into some of these uh, uh, taste proteins, gustucin and trip M5 uh, in particular. But a lot of work yet to be done. I think our last question is from the web. I have a question from, uh, by Maurice Parent. I have heard a lot about meal size, but wonder what the speakers think about neurocontrols of meal frequency and snacking. Mm. I don't know anything about the controls of snacking. <laughs> Being an inveterate snacker myself, um, I know that the snacks are very small generally. But um, uh, I think that I think that I, I'm, I'm a I'm a believer in that the major control of the total intake is going to be uh, determined by the size of the meal, for whatever the stimulus is that turns the meal on, and um, and so. Uh, um, you know, to, to the extent that the elevation of gut peptides, for example, reduces um, uh, lengthency in intermeal interval, I think that the uh, that that there may be reason to cons to think that the gut peptides can um, inhibit the initiating of, of new small meals. But I think uh, again, it depends a lot on the, the context at which the eating occurs. Uh, last question, and if, if you could make it brief. Thank you. So, uh, Joe Herskovic on the workshop planning committee. I just have a question. What, what, if any, is the effect of olfaction on any of the taste mechanisms that we discussed this morning? That nice coming this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Big. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that would be, uh, again, more a topic of discussion this afternoon. Um, you know, we typically think of olfaction and taste together. Uh, and as you uh, consume uh, a food, you're stimulating uh, your taste cells, but uh, retronasally, you're also stimulating uh, the olfactory system. And so there are going to be uh, central uh, effects, uh, flavor uh, effects, where uh, probably uh, the sum of uh, gustatory uh, via taste cells and uh, olfactory responses, uh, both orthonasally and retronasally, uh, are just giving you uh, greater uh, flavor, and, and that's going to have uh, all sorts of uh, effects, um, um, you know, higher cortical uh, effects and associative uh, effects on uh, uh, meal uh, appreciation and, and so on. So. Uh, I would be remiss if I uh, said uh, the olfactory system was not important to this. Well, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, we will reconvene promptly at 1.30. Um, there is a cafeteria that is one story down from here in the basement. Um, and members of the food forum and the speakers in the workshop 
uh, committee should go to room 120. Um, I want to very much thank the speakers for a fascinating and terrific session, and thank you all so much for your contribution. Thank you.